So now we're moving on to lesson seven, and we're going to go until about nine o'clock, and then um, you can have a, a 10 minute coffee break. So I'll try to keep my eye on the clock up there. And this is a caveat. So there's actually a three day call for design course that we teach the National Highway Institute. So what you're getting is kind of like the, the very basic nuts and bolts um, that we probably cover in um, half a day to two thirds of the day in the public design course. Um, I'm not going to say this is sufficient for everything you'll ever need for public design, but it will introduce you to some of the basic concepts so that if you go into the resource document, which is HDS5, um, Hydraulic Design of Highway Culverts, when you start reading it, it won't seem like it's written in Greek. Um, it hopefully will make a lot more sense because okay? it talks about some concepts that take a little while to get used to. Inlet control and outlet control, and there's a lot of vocabulary and stuff. But hopefully after uh, this session, which may actually take us till about lunchtime, uh, I think you'll have more of an appreciation and understanding of the very basics. And again, that's what I keep saying, uh, continuing the message from yesterday, we're looking at the big picture concepts. And once you understand the big picture concepts, um, then you can start getting into the weeds a little bit more. And that stuff is a little bit more actually cookbook -y. But the big picture concepts, you can apply those using your designer and engineering intuition to make sense of a lot of the issues and problems that you're going to run into in your design work. Do we know when uh, the culvert design class is going to come back around in our area? Um, it's all, um, Chase, who does the me. training coordination? Are, it's are you actually responsible? Yeah, we haven't really talked about doing another one yet, but yeah, if you guys want one, we can do one. Mm -hmm. so. We've got a couple people that would be interested. Okay. okay. And if you want that, I would be interested. I, I taught it here with Jim Shaw the last time it was offered, and I would be interested in coming back again. Okay. Yeah. It's an yeah. awesome course. Yeah. Um, again, you'll get the flavor of it from this, and um, if you go watch Jim, Jim's YouTube video on the culvert design and terminology and stuff with the flume. But if the course is actually offered here, he, he brings the flume with him. And then we have a split class between workshop exercises and flume exercises. It's really interesting. Okay. All right, learning objectives. So these are the things that we want to accomplish. Describe inlet and outlet control. List the factors that influence culvert design. Uh, we'll summarize the hydraulic design process. So this is just the hydraulic design process. There's also a structural design component that's, that's uh, equally important. Um, we'll describe the procedure for calculating culvert outlet velocity. So that's something that you get introduced to and that you'll probably have to meditate on for it to completely make sense. So we'll talk about it today, and if you think about it overnight, and then if you have more questions, we can come back to it tomorrow morning. We'll size the culvert using nomographs, and then we'll actually, um, I would actually like to take the time to run the same problem using HY8, so we'll see how our time is, is working out. Uh, we do that in the culvert design course, and I think it would be kind of neat. So again, going back to uh, what are the important resources for culvert, uh, the hydraulic design of culverts, uh, the Federal Highway has. Uh, again, there's Jim doing his YouTube or his YouTube uh, flume demos. Um, it's the 056 uh, culvert design course through NHI that's uh, really good. Um, we actually have again free web-based training on how to use HY8. So HY8 is the Federal Highway program for culvert analysis. So I, if you haven't taken that, and I'm guessing probably most of you have not, uh, it probably is about a three to four hour effort. You do it at your own pace. If you, if you register with NHI so you have an account, you just go in there and sign up and take it, and it's free. Um, and it's pretty valuable, and it gives you the very basics of using the HYA software program. So I, I would recommend that. And then the document is uh, Hydraulic Design Series 5 um, that you download from, I'm not sure if it's posted on your R drive, but you download it for, directly from the Federal Highway website. All right, so terminology. 
uh, and we'll be talking a lot about headwater. And so typically what happens when we do a conventional culvert design, um, we have a barrel area that more often than not uh, has, a, has an area, a flow area that's less than the flow area of the channel. So the water has to contract to go into the culvert of our barrel. And to get the energy to do that, it builds up, or it ponds water at the inlet of the culvert. And that's what we call the headwater. On the downstream tie, uh, side, if we have headwater up there, then this is the tailwater elevation down here. This is something that we actually need to calculate. And if we have steady, uniform flow conditions, we can calculate the tailwater depth using Another one? Steady uniform flow conditions. And, and, and equation. Yeah. We do use the energy equation to analyze culverts mm -hmm. in outlet control, and we'll be talking about that. All right. So tail water with steady uniform flow. So in your ditch lines, um, you, that's usually just fine. Manning's equation to calculate the tail water. Uh, we have a barrel slope on our culvert. Um, a lot of times that is equivalent to the channel slope. And there may be reasons why at some point we have a different slope. Maybe it has a lesser slope than the channel. And if that's the case, then there will be an elevation difference, and we'll talk about why that might be important. Then we have our invert in our crown of our pipe. The crown of the pipe is the top, the invert's the bottom. So here's the invert at the outlet, and here's the invert at the inlet side. And then up here is our roadway. So flows going this direction through the culvert. And here's our roadway, and traffic is this direction. All right. So now here's here's the thing. Whenever we do culvert analysis, uh, we're going to look to see if the culvert is what we call inlet controlled or outlet controlled. So we'll start with the inlet controlled one first. An inlet control culvert is on what we call steep slopes. Well, then you ask, well, what's a steep slope? Well, a rule of thumb that we've kind of put out there is that you know a steep slope is kind of like 1% or more. So you could have an inlet control culvert on a slope that's less than 1%. And we have to analyze for that. But another definition of steep slope is when you have supercritical flow. So that's sometimes used to describe steep slopes. So an inlet control culvert, steep slope, the barrel, the barrel of the culvert flows part full in supercritical flow. So it's that faster moving flow. Um, and if we have our headwater here, the water comes in, and this is inlet controlled. So this is supercritical flow. The flow depth is less than critical depth and it dives down through what depth? It's going from sub to supercritical, so it has to transition through what specific depth? Critical. critical depth. So we also say that in the control culverts, <coughs> critical depth occurs at the inlet. And we also said that critical depth in culvert design can also be called the control section. So critical depth of the control section occurs at the inlet. In this case then, um, we're actually going to analyze the culvert as a weir at lower flows when it's not submerged, or as an orifice at higher flows when it's fully submerged, and knowing that a transit there's a transition zone from weir flow to orifice flow. We also say that uh, the barrel um, is not flowing in capacity and the inlet is actually regulating the amount of flow or controlling the amount of flow. And so it's a flow limiter. If we did something to improve the inlet so that flow could transition into the barrel, we would actually get more flow into the barrel and we'd be able to then lower our headwater because it would take less energy to force flow through here. So the control section, critical depth, is near the inlet. The inlet actually restricts the amount of flow we can get into our culvert, and it's on steeper slopes. All right. So we're going to go through this a few times, 
because it takes a few times discussing this in different ways for it to maybe sink in. But that's the general gist of an inlet control culvert. So if I asked you what flow type do you have in the barrel in inlet controlled conditions, you would say super critical flow. Okay. If I said where is the control section in an inlet controlled culvert, you would say at the inlet. If I said to you what's restricting the flow in an inlet control culvert, you would say the inlet. Okay. If I did something to improve the inlet, then I would get more flow into my culvert because it's not using a lot of its area. It's inefficient because the inlet is restricting the amount of flow. What would be an example of this? If I'm really thirsty and I've been working outside in the grass or whatever and I have a nice big cool drink, if I take that and if I drink it like this, that's kind of defeating the purpose, right? Because this, my mouth, is limiting the flow. If I open up my mouth wider, then I can get more flow or more of that cool, refreshing liquid beverage into my throat or the barrel of the culvert. Okay. So if I do something to improve the entrance by making it wider, uh, making a more favorable inlet configuration, maybe changing the shape a little bit, I can get more flow into the barrel. So this is an inlet control condition right here. Here's some different cases of inlet control. So how do we know this is inlet control? Again, um, you see here is the case we kind of just looked at. You have water, it's coming in through the barrel, it's cascading down through a critical depth, and it's flowing in supercritical flow. Same thing here. Um, water, it cascades through critical depth, goes to supercritical flow. And I know this is supercritical specifically here because why? You see a hydraulic jump, and we always know that with a hydraulic jump, that's a rapid transition from super to subcritical flow, and you see it's occurring right here under this higher tailwater condition. You see the barrel's full here, but you still have critical depth, you still have the control section here, you still have supercritical flow, um, so you know that this is still inlet control condition. Same thing over here, you have a lower headwater, you have high tailwater, but you still see this uh, hydraulic jump, so you know that this is supercritical flow. Supercritical flow in the barrel equates to inlet control. So on C there, it's subcritical flow before it enters? Yeah, this is, yeah, that's a good yeah. point. This is most, yeah, because it's gonna, you know, it's gonna still pass actually, through. actually, we don't know. Okay. Um, if we had critical depth, and if critical depth is like here, mm -hmm. then that would be supercritical. You can have different depths of supercritical flow, but once it exceeds critical depth, then it goes back into sub. So I, I don't know. This could be subcritical, or it could be supercritical entering the barrel. Mm -hmm. um, up here, we have a low, um, and this might be another case too. It looks like this is probably diving down through critical depth. So this is probably subcritical, but we have low headwater, low tailwater, supercritical flow in the barrel, so we know that's inlet control. And you said yeah. supercritical flow in the barrel indicates inlet control. That's mm -hmm. just true all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. So, in inlet control, I said what's limiting the flow or what's limiting um, the ability to, to uh, pass more flow through the barrel is the stuff that happens at the inlet. Okay? The throat doesn't affect it at all because I have a lot of extra capacity here. I just need to get the flow through the inlet into the barrel. So whatever I can do to change the things at the inlet side will help me improve my hydraulic capacity in the culvert. And the things that happen at the inlet side are listed here. Headwater, of course, is at the inlet. There's the area of the inlet. Uh, there's a shape of the inlet, and there's something that we call the inlet configuration. Does anyone know what that might be? The inlet configuration, what does that mean? Yeah, it could be kind of related to the alignment. I could see that. The edges of the barrel. 
Yeah, so the edges. So if you have kind of like a square edge, and we'll take a look at a couple pictures. If you have a square edge entrance, um, which would be, um, think of like a box culvert just with square edges, like in a head wall, and you don't, you don't put a bevel on it, right? So, but if you actually go in and put that kind of like taper or that bevel around the head wall, that would be an improvement to the entrance, and that would help you get more flow into the barrel. So those are things, and we'll take a look at some pictures, but those things relate to inlet configuration. The barrel slope itself is not important uh, for determining the headwater and then the capacity of the culvert itself. However, we know that barrel slope is important for the outlet velocity. A barrel slope like this will have less velocity um, coming out the outlet than a barrel slope like this, right? It's kind of like the water slide. If you go on a water slide like this, you're going to like say, that's no fun. If you go on a water slide like this, then you're going to go zipping down through there because you have a lot of velocity. So like, so like at the inlet, so like if you had wings, say on a concrete box, you had wings, that would be part of that in the configuration? It depends on the flare angle. So there okay. are favorable flare angles and there are ones that really don't help you out at all. And it, the, you know, the most dramatic case of that is when they're actually perpendicular to the flow. It's not really helping that flow transition into the barrel. If they're, if they're flared, the flow's coming this way. If they're, and this is in uh, HDS-5. If they're flared at a certain range of angles, that helps that wall, pick up that water and then transition it into the barrel. Mm -hmm. And we're taking advantage of what principle? Which of the three big equations? Continuity. Not continuity. Momentum. Momentum. It's momentum. Because we talked about yesterday, water's not going to take right, right turns, right? 90 degree turns. It wants to transition gradually unless it's forced to do something else. And when you force it to take abrupt turns, it's going to pay you back with scour and erosion and all kinds of issues. But you want it to gradually turn. So if you have your wing walls flared at you know a certain range of favorable angles, that can help that water gradually turn into the barrel. And this is where it helps seeing the stuff in the flume because it, it, you really get a good idea of, of, of some of this. So again, I introduced the topic, but we're going to come back and talk about it at least a couple more times. So this is just planting the seed. Um, so we talk about inlet control. The other way that a culvert could be operating is what we call outlet control. Outlet control occurs on mild slopes and the flow could be one of two conditions in the barrel. In this condition, you see full barrel flow. So it uses the entire barrel area. It could also be subcritical flow. Mild slope, subcritical flow. Steep slope, supercritical flow. So there's another way that you could describe those, those two different flow types, sub and supercritical. So if we have mild slopes, subcritical or full barrel flow, that culvert is operating in outlet control. In outlet control, it becomes a little bit more complicated because um, we also have to consider what's going on inside the barrel. In inlet control, the barrel doesn't matter with the headwater. It doesn't impact the headwater. It's just whatever happens here at the inlet that you can have some control of. In outlet control, the barrel now comes into play. So you have to be concerned with the barrel length and the barrel roughness, and then also with your tailwater condition. So all aspects of the culvert, including tailwater, affect the flow. We're not using the weir and orifice equations in this condition. We're going back to using one of our good friends, the energy equation. So what we'll actually do is, just like we kind of did yesterday in one of our exercises, we're going to look at what is the total energy here, and that's going to equal the total energy at the outside of the culvert at the downstream end plus head losses. And that's why the barrel comes into play because we have additional head losses. We have, um, we have a head loss as the flow contracts at the entrance. And that's a local loss. That's a very common local energy head loss. We have a head loss as the water proceeds through the barrel due to friction. Energy loss through friction with the boundary. So we have, that's the biggest one in outlet control, the friction loss through the barrel, and 
then we have another head, local head loss as flow re-expands into the tailwater at the downstream side. So those are the three basic head losses. And so if we can calculate those, and if we can calculate the energy level here, then we add on those head losses, and we bring that back up, and we now have our, our total energy up here. And we've done our analysis, and that can give us our headwater elevation or our headwater depth. And then we just calculate out that velocity as something else that we need to do. So an inlet control, uh, it's a combination of using the Weir and Orifice equations for the analysis, and outlet control, it's strictly an application of the energy equation that we looked at yesterday. And actually, that's that's probably about 75% of the hydraulic design call books. Seems kind of almost underwhelming, doesn't it? <laughs> You're looking for something shocking, revolutionary, and it gets you really excited. And we pull the curtain back, and that's pretty much what it is. So here's some different uh, outlet control cases, similar to what we did for inlet control. Um, high headwater, high tailwater, this barrel is flowing. Full, right? Full. We have high headwater, lower tailwater, and so the barrel is flowing. Well, it's full up here, right? But this, and then it transitions into subcritical, and then what do you think is happening here? Critical depth, exactly. Yep. So if we talk about control sections, once again, we say critical depth is a control section. Um, a, so right here, our control section would be wherever it hits critical depth. Here, we don't have critical depth anymore, right? Because this is all full flow and sub subcritical. So in this case, the control would be the tailwater. This we'll talk about this again, but just to introduce the concepts. Here, the control is the tailwater. Here, the control is at the is critical depth at the outlet. All right, here we have subcritical flow subcritical flow through the barrel, and it looks like this is also a tailwater control because I'm not seeing where it would transition to cr through critical depth. Here we have um, subcritical, subcritical, it looks like it's probably diving down through critical depth, so here the control would be critical depth at the outlet. Critical depth, tailwater, critical depth, tailwater control. I have a question. <coughs> yes. It seems to me, uh, A, the, <coughs> it, the same as the one in the uh, It kind of looks the same, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's just a matter of the flow types. I and mean, we can't tell here, but it's in like controlled, so this has to be super critical. And maybe we could have illustrated that better. But this is super critical flow. This has to be critical depth. So this is probably diving down through critical depth right in here somewhere. But it does look very much the same, I agree. Here we're just saying it's subcritical. So critical depth must be down in here somewhere. It's probably like right here. And maybe that would help if we actually had where uh, drew in the, the line for critical depth, just so you can see that this is subcritical and then this is supercritical. And maybe we'll do that next time we revise this. I don't know if that matters, but it looks more like the, the water's like humped up. On the other one, it kind of looks like it's diving down. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you know, there's opportunity <coughs> to touch these up a little bit. And it probably would help just drawing a line where critical depth is. And then you can, and then that's what you're actually looking for is, yeah. is it subcritical, is it supercritical, where is critical depth located? And that tells you if it's in or out of control. So factors that influence our culvert design, so that's our headwater calculations uh, primarily. Uh, we're looking for, of course, the headwater. Um, we have the area of the barrel, the shape of the barrel. The inlet configuration is still important because we said we have an energy, a local loss at the inlet. So as the water contracts into the barrel and outlet control, there's that local loss of the inlet. So if we can improve the inlet a little bit, that might help push that local loss down a little. And so we'd have a little bit less energy loss. However, most of the energy loss in, in um, outlet control condition comes through that frictional resistance as the water's being pushed through the barrel. 
Um, barrel slope is important. Um, barrel length and roughness are the combined frictional resistance. So if you have a rough barrel that's short, you have so much frictional resistance. If you have a rough barrel that's really long, you have a lot more frictional resistance. So there's two components, the barrel roughness and the barrel length, and these two combine to let you know what your frictional resistance and your friction loss is. And then the tail water condition. So if I go to the amusement park, and I get up at the top of the water slide, and I actually haven't been on the water slide in like 20 years, so I, I don't know, do they still like using that or something, or you just sit down? Okay. So say there's a mat, and I jump on the mat, and I'm looking really, I'm looking down really far here, and I take the plunge and I zip down that water slide, the flow type would be super critical. All right. So if I'm standing right there at the edge and there's someone down who's already gone down and they're splashing around, do I notice any of that? If they're splashing around in the water uh, as they're going down the slide, does that impact me whatsoever standing up here at the top? No. No. That's because it's no propagate upstream if it's... Yeah. That's absolutely 100% correct. Nothing, no, none of that disturbance or those energy losses or whatever propagate upstream. I don't even know. I don't care. It might as well be like nothing below me even exists because it does not impact me. Okay? Once I get onto the slide and I'm part of the flow, then I have a certain velocity which translates into eventually into my outlet flow velocity. But standing up here, I wouldn't even know that someone down there is splashing around. That's an inlet control condition. And in that control, the flow that's entering the barrel, it doesn't even care what's going on in the barrel because the water in the barrel is zipping by so fast that none of those disturbances or energy losses or whatever else is going on there translate translates to the headwater where I'm at at the top of the water slide. I might as well just be looking at an opening and anything beyond that is irrelevant. Okay? And so once again, that's why we can use the wear and orifice equations because we're only considered with that one little section, that, that entrance. What happens downstream of that is, is completely irrelevant. It just doesn't matter. That's inlet control. And that's why we use the wear and orifice equations to analyze that one section. Conversely, uh, I actually did this. This was, uh, this was pretty scary. I never thought it would be scary with this. So um, during Halloween, uh, I went to one of these uh, haunted farm kind of things. So they had the haunted barn. Anyone ever do that? Kind of like, does anyone like to do that? I, I love scary stuff. <laughs> I love scary movies. I like haunted attractions. So I went to this this big haunted farm. They had the haunted barn. And so one thing, and this this totally freaked me out. Uh, you go in, and then they have like this tunnel that the entrance is is illuminated with like the black lights. Okay, so you go into the tunnel, and then it gets dark, and then the tunnel contracts an area. And so you're going like this, and there's, there's like people coming in behind you, and you can't see anything. And then you're down like this, and all of a sudden, it contracts so much that I'm on my hands and knees, and I'm crawling, and I'm starting to get claustrophobic, and, and starting to freak out, and you can't see, and then you're almost having to push your way through the last part of the tunnel until you come out in the room on the other side. So the last like 10 or 15 feet, you're having to squeeze and push, and then there's people coming in behind you trying to push, and it's just really, really scary. That is outlet control condition, all right? Cause you get in, you get in through the entrance, and the entrance wasn't a big deal. It wasn't contracted enough where, you know, I, I maybe had to turn a little bit. There's a little bit of energy loss. But then that barrel, I tell you what, I'm pushing and trying to get past all of that frictional resistance and I'm losing a lot of energy, right? And there's, you know, I'm squeezing through there and then all of a sudden I try to squeeze out through the other side and I have that expansion loss as I get back out into the room. That's outlet control. So the entrance matters a little bit. The big thing that matters is the barrel and what's going on in the barrel. And then I have a little bit more energy loss as I re-expand into the room in the barn at the exit. That's outlet control condition. I'm moving slowly, subcritical, or full flow, right? When I get down to real, where it's really contracted, even I filled up the barrel, and it was full flow, 
that's sub that's outlet control, subcritical, or full flow. So the way you make sense of these things, and the way you make sense of anything in life, is put it in a metaphor that you can relate to, and it kind of makes sense. And that's the way you can also explain it to other people. So if there's a difficult concept, pull back out of the weeds, think of what is the big picture. The big picture is always usually pretty straightforward and simple. Think of the big picture, put it in terms of a personal metaphor that other people can relate to. Going back to our friend the Yoji Spillway then, um, could I borrow that water pump? This is your culvert. If I turn this, is it going to spill or anything? Good. Pretend I have my culvert and it's right here. Okay. The control section, say it's critical depth in this case, is right here at the outlet, and therefore you know it's outlet control. The control section and outlet control is either at the outlet or it's the tailwater. Okay. If, it's, if there's critical depth occurring, if this is shallow tailwater and it's spilling out through critical depth, the control section is here. Um, if it's high tailwater, then the tailwater actually is the control section. Mild slope, it's either flowing in subcritical flow, right? This is all subcritical flow. We discussed this yesterday. This is subcritical flow here. So this water in the barrel is either subcritical or full flow. Um, the water is trying to push through the entrance and it's pushing through the barrel. The barrel is actually regulating how much flow is passing. If you could do something to improve the barrel condition, you'll probably get more capacity and more flow going through there. Okay? So the barrel is actually, the barrel or the tailwater is actually constricting the flow and regulating the flow condition. Conversely, if I put my culvert here, this is the water slide. So this was the this was the scary tunnel in the haunted barn. And this is the water slide. The water of the flow type in this barrel is, the control section is at the entrance, and that's critical depth. Um, the factors that are important here are, the factors that are kind of regulating and controlling the flow are the inlet, and those would be the area, the shape, the inlet configuration, and the headwater level, right? Um, the barrel really doesn't matter at all with the headwater calculations. It, it's irrelevant because this just appears to the water like an orifice. Once it gets in here, it's just, it's fun time. It's just zipping away. The barrel is irrelevant. Um, the only thing is with the slope, the slope is important to calculate for our outlet velocity in the inlet control condition as it is with the outlet control condition. Inlet control, outlet control. Supercritical flow, full flow, or subcritical flow. Analyze using the wear and orifice equations. Analyze because we have to consider the frictional resistance of the barrel, the inlet energy local loss, the outlet local loss. Analyze this with the energy equation. These things. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. What's your question? Yeah. On the previous slide, uh, on how outlet control is set, uh, how inlet computation affect? Inlet computation affect. Oh, I'm sorry. This one? Or the other one? This one. This is an inlet computation like part of the factor increasing. Yeah. The inlet configuration is important in outlet control because we're doing an energy balance or an energy analysis. Okay. So typically for your simple public designs, um, you're going to have three components to your energy loss. Uh, there's going to be a local loss at the inlet as the flow contracts to go into the opening. And we'll describe how to calculate that. Then there's the friction resistance of the barrel. And then there's the local loss at the outlet as the flow re-expands into the flow at the outlet side. And we'll talk about how to calculate all these pieces. So in the inlet configuration is important in outlet control because if you can make it more favorable so the flow has a more gradual turn into culvert, 
you can drop or diminish that local energy loss at the inlet. And that matters a little bit. In the outlet control, it matters a little bit. So we say if there's something easy that you can do, bevels. That's all you need to do for outlet control, and you're good to go. And that will drop that local energy loss at the inlet by a little bit. Um, but the big thing is the barrel itself, because you're going to lose a lot of energy through the frictional resistance in the barrel. <coughs> so ponder this stuff. Let it stew a little bit. This is what happens in the culvert course. I actually had culverts done in college, and I came out still not knowing what that was. And then I attended the Senegai course, and then I attended it again, and then it started to come into place. So it takes a little while. Partially, but again, focus on the big picture concepts. Inlet control and outlet control. What matters in inlet control? What matters in outlet control? What are the flow types in inlet control? What are the flow types in outlet control? What equations are used in inlet control? What equations are used in outlet control? That's the key stuff right now. too as we go through the next few slides but again the basic thing is when you start thinking about inlet or outlet control what flow type do you have super critical flow nothing downstream um, matters if you're standing at the inlet so you're just worried about the actual inlet condition itself once you get past the inlet you're off to the races you're zipping through super critical flow through the barrel frictional resistance doesn't matter or tailwater doesn't matter you're just gone um, outlet control, you're kind of slogging through because it's on a mild slope, sub, critical flow, or full flow. So you get through the entrance, and then you're slogging through the barrel and encountering frictional resistance, and then you have to push yourself out into tailwater. So that's where all the losses are considered, and it's more of an energy problem at that point, right? Because you're losing energy as you're trying to push through all that stuff. Excellent. All right. So we, once again, we'll hit the factors. Um, in inlet control, it's the stuff at the inlet that matters. And so again, that's the headwater, the inlet area, shape, and configuration. The barrel slope doesn't really impact the headwater. It does a tiny little bit, and it's so tiny that we just neglect it. Um, what it does impact is the outlet velocity. This is inlet control, it's greater than 1% slope. It has an outlet velocity that's less than this inlet control condition on the water slide. So the slope will impact the outlet velocity, which is also an important design consideration. Outlet control, everything matters. You push through the inlet and you have a little bit of energy loss, so you have the headwater, um, the inlet configuration, you're into the barrel, so the barrel has a certain area and shape and slope. You're losing frictional resistance, and that comes into play with the roughness and the length. And then you have to push out into the tailwater, and you encounter another local loss as you re-expand into the flow. And so the energy analysis takes into consideration all these things. All right. So let's look at some of these factors and how we impact um, situations. What flow condition is this? Inlet or outlet control? Why? Your control section, your critical depth is here at the inlet. You can see the flow diving down through into a very shallow depth, so critical depth is right near the entrance. Same thing with this. Uh, it's not flowing full for sure, and if it's going through critical depth, then this is super critical flow. So this is inlet control. 
And it kind of makes sense that if we have uh, a situation where we increase the area of the inlet, we can get more flow past the inlet. And that's what we see here. If we were to keep the headwaters the same, then in this case, with a two foot diameter pipe, we have 32 cubic feet per second. And with a 48 inch diameter pipe, we have 115 cubic feet per second. Probably what actually happens in reality is as you increase the size of this, you do get more flow through here, but you also drop the head water. So effect of the shape on the culvert performance, and again, this is inlet control. So we look at a circular pipe, this one, and an arch pipe, uh, pipe arch, that's this one here. Uh, they have about this, actually the exact same barrel area and we see that with this uh, circular uh, pipe culvert, and we just pick a headwater here, let's say it's eight feet. Uh, for a circular pipe, we're passing about 263.28 CFS. Wow. Pretty <laughs> accurate. Right, exactly, right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Don't do that. Yeah, Don't do that. Yeah, we're great. <laughs> yeah, 260 CFS, give or take, 20%. That's more like it, right? And then we see with the pipe arch, we go over here and it's passing maybe something like, you know, 280, 290. So for the same headwater level, and that's again that pond of water at the entrance, the pipe arch with the same barrel area actually passes more flow. Why is that? Because it's the flatter base. It, the gravity doesn't impact the, the water going through the pipe as much as it does on a circular pipe because it requires more head water to keep that water at a higher elevation in a circular pipe than in an arch pipe. I think, I think you're covered it pretty well. Um, the center of area of this is here. The center of area of this is probably down in here somewhere. So you have more pressure head pushing on the center of area here, pushing water through, and you have a lesser pressure head pushing water through the center of area of this shape here. So it's kind of like um, if you go dive into the deep end of the pool um, and you dive down for that quarter, as you get closer and closer to the bottom, you can feel all that pressure pushing on you. That's kind of like that pressure head. Um, that pressure head is pushing on the center of area. There's more pressure head. So you're diving actually down further, there's more pressure head pushing on the center here than pressure head pushing on the center here. So you have more energy pushing through the meat of this area than you do in this one. So you would expect this one actually to be more efficient. But why, apart from that, why else might you use a pipe arch as opposed to this one? Cover. Yeah. Cover. Cover. Yeah, you know, a lot of stuff that we do in design is dictated by the site conditions and the geometry and, and the terrain. And if you have an issue with getting enough cover over your pipe for the structural integrity of the system, then you can actually get more cover over a pipe arch and pass even more flow than for circular shape. All right. Now we'll we're go back for just a second. The configuration. So we'll go back a, for just a second for sure. some question. On your uh, round and your uh, arch pipe, mm -hmm. <coughs> the circumference on your arch pipe is a little bigger, which makes sense because mm -hmm. the circle would have the smallest um, circumference over Correct. for the given area. Kind of like the, um, the, perim the uh, perimeter. Not the, if it's flowing full, it would be the wetted perimeter. Right. The hydraulic radius is higher. So for this example, and I don't know if it's every case then, I, get, I'm, I would imagine it depends on what the pipes are made out of, but in this example then, the difference in the pressure head is bigger than, is it more of an impact than the roughness of the edge of the Correct. surface of the pipe. Correct. Okay. Yeah, um, and Steve, with the point you're making here is if these are actually flowing full, then the water in here is contacting more of the boundary, so you think right. we have more frictional resistance than this, but what condition are we looking at? In that control, yeah. so, so frictional resistance is a anyway. It doesn't matter. 
Yeah. But in outlet control, yeah, it would play, there's a balance of more frictional resistance, but more pressure head pushing on the center of area. So it's a trade off. And I'm thinking that the pressure head probably is more of an impact than that additional frictional loss. Are we going to see that later, or am I just way out on a tangent? No, that's a good point. Um, I don't know if, I can't remember if we look at this now, like control, and I may have clipped it out due to time constraints. But uh, you do, if you do your analysis in HYA, you can check the two different shapes and outlet control and see. Um, I believe the pressure head is probably the bigger. You know what? I'm postulating that. I don't know for certain. I would assume it probably would be with the pipe. Well, if they had the same um, roughness coefficient, the circular one and the pipe arch, so you'd have to look at the corrugation patterns. And honestly, I don't know how they're fabricated, if they have the same coordination pattern or not. All right, so degree of contraction. So we're going to consider real briefly in like configurations. And again, we're looking at in like control conditions. Uh, we have these different types, and I think I have pictures of most of these. Um, we cover, I'll just cover this in a lot more detail in the call reports. You have thin edge projecting, so if you have like a corrugated metal pipe and it's sticking out of your embankment, that's a thin edge projecting condition. If you then take that corrugated metal pipe that's sticking out, um, protruding from your embankment, and you slice it off so that it's flush with your embankment, that would be mitered to the fill slope. And so that's actually a little bit more favorable for water to bend in than the thin edge projecting. <coughs> Um, and even more favorable is uh, a culvert in a head wall with a square edge. Um, and even more favorable for water to gradually turn into the barrel is if you have your concrete pipe delivered to your site, you know there's, there's one end of it that's going to have that bell end on it, that grooved end. If you actually have that as your inlet condition, that's pretty hydraulically efficient. Um, it almost functions, it's called like a step bevel, so it almost functions very similar to a bevel condition. Um, then you have your beveled edge, and again, that's just taking that sharp corner and just making a nice little taper. And it doesn't take much to improve your hydraulic efficiency. Tapered inlets we're not going to talk about. Um, that's if, um, if you're interested during a break, I mean, I can pull those up and show you some pictures. If you have your barrel, um, and then it, and then at the entrance of the barrel, you widen the face out, so you're changing the area and the shape a little bit. So you widen that face out so that it slope, it side tapers into your barrel, that's a side tapered entrance. And then you can also taper it this way and drop it down and rotate your barrel down a little bit. And that's a slope tapered entrance. Um, and again, I can show you some pictures during a break or during lunch if you're interested in seeing what that looks like. Those are very, very hydraulically efficient in it like the All right, so here we have, that's that socket or grooved end entrance. So you're just kind of like leaving this on your concrete pipe when it's delivered, you're not cutting it off. Okay. Uh, here you have, yeah, here you see this top bevel right here. And again, it's, it's not a lot, it's a, a half inch per foot of rise or spin, whichever one gives you the greater bevel but it's not a lot, half inch per foot. Um, you could also go up to an inch per foot and that increases your efficiency just a little bit over the half inch per foot. And you also see a bevel here um, on this piece of head wall on this one. And these wing walls, these may be at that favorable angle where you can kind of get the idea, and a lot of this is visualization, but as the flow is coming in, um, and it kind of catches this, it's kind of hard to do. Um, and, bend in the barrel, flow's coming in this way, and flow's coming in this way, catches this and kind of bends into the barrel here. Okay. These are almost, these are probably thin edge projecting because they're sticking out a little bit. You can see they, maybe at some point they were tapered to the fill slope, um, but it looks like there's been some erosion around here, so it probably transitioned back into thin edge projecting. I wouldn't take credit for these being tapered to the fill slope, but that's the general idea. You take that pipe and you cut it and you, and you, you uh, make it flush with the fill. Here's a thin edge projecting over here. This does not have a bevel, so this is just a square edge condition. 
Um, this I would probably consider a little bit better than a thin edge projecting condition. Um, but if we're not sure, we always err on the side of conservatism. So I might just consider this a thin edge projecting condition. And we'll show you uh, how that impacts the, the analysis. Actually, this one is a cool one to focus on for a minute. Um, we talked about, um, if this is outlet control, uh, we talked about energy losses, right? So in this case, um, you might add a little bit additional entrance head loss because water has to get through this grate and then that grate's going to eventually do what? Oh, it's going to start picking up trash and twigs and things like that. So you also may want to, if you were to design something like this for safety reasons, maybe you don't want kids crawling inside your culvert, um, you probably would maybe experiment with diminishing the opening area a little bit and see how that impacts your hydraulic performance. But you want to do something knowing that this probably is not going to be maintained on a regular basis. And you want to be very conservative with your design then. So maybe diminish the open area a little bit, maybe add in, if it's outlet control, add in some additional energy losses, uh, whatever you think appropriate. And then again, like Veronica said the other day, put that in your design documentation. All right, so here's an inlet bevel. Here, here's a better picture of an inlet bevel. And this is just on the head wall. Um, if these if these wing walls are the square edge ones, then you might want to try to experiment with the bevel on these. If they're flared at a good angle, then you're not going to put a bevel on those because the flare will take care of the increased performance of the water coming in from the sides. And then as the water comes in from the top and bends down, this is going to improve that efficiency. You know what that vena contracted is? It's kind of like when water comes down into a, a culvert or an opening. Could, uh, same thing occurs with bridges. Um, and here's, here's the, uh, the bridge opening here. As water bends down through here, it's not automatically going to come here and hit the top of your culvert or the inside of your bridge, right? It's going to bend down. Um, it's going to bend down like this and then turn in. And so you have kind of like this air pocket up here of, of no flow occurring, and that's diminished capacity. So it's going to bend down like this. If you put a nice little bevel here, then as it bends down, it's going to contract, it's going to decrease that vertical contraction to maybe something more like that. Okay. So that's why we put the bevels on the top. We put what around it be more efficient, but it's just easier to do a bevel. Yeah, you know what? For I think the minor I, difference you get. I think, and I'm not sure. Actually, it was Wisconsin when we were teaching the call course in Wisconsin mm -hmm. in Green Bay a few weeks ago. They actually do some rounded doubles on some of theirs. I would think it is a little bit more tricky to form as opposed to just having like a, a linear bevel. But yeah, there there are actually one state that does it in some in some cases. But I don't know of many states that actually do the rounded. All right. So here's just a good picture. Um, we're standing at what end of the culvert, the inlet or the outlet? Inlet, inlet. So I heard inlet and outlet. No one said the middle, which is good. So at least that's something right there. We're actually standing at the outlet because, you know, a big part of being successful in drainage design and hydraulic engineering is being able to visualize the flow and, and think about what's going on and why. So you see water up here is kind of ponded, right? This is the headwater. And as water enters this barrel, it cascades down through critical depth. It flows in very shallow, turbulent fashion through the barrel, and then it splashes out at the outlet, and you can see here the tailwater pool, right? So we're actually standing at the outlet, looking back up through the barrel, and this is what type of control condition? It's inlet control, so you get a good idea of what inlet control looks like. Look how much capacity we have in that barrel that's not being used. Um, and this isn't a real high flow condition, but even if this water were up here, we probably wouldn't have a very high water level in the barrel. So if we could do something to change this entrance configuration to make it more favorable for the momentum of the water to carry into the barrel, 
then we could use more of this capacity and also at the same time drop the headwater level. I feel like if it's going to be flowing full, I feel like that dirt's going to be moving. Like, if it's going to be flowing full, I feel like that dirt's going to be moving. Well, yeah, I, I mean, don't this, uh, feel like the pipe is that's, really that's one of the crappiest culverts to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend that. From that aspect, it's horrible. Um, but yeah, uh, that's probably, you know what, that's probably, and I don't know for sure that's going to be a forest road somewhere. Maybe it's even a temporary crossing or something. You, you would never do something like this here. All right, so effective barrel slope on culvert performance. Um, I already know that inlet control culverts have steep slopes. Uh, slope in inlet control impacts the headwater to such a negligible degree that we don't really account for it or worry about it. Um, but again, it has a lot to do with outlet velocity. So we're going to talk a little bit about outlet velocity at the end of this lesson. If you're seeing that your outlet velocities are really high, there's a couple of main things that you could do with your culvert design, apart from using energy dissipators, which we're not talking about this week. But there's something, two things that you could try with your culvert design. Um, and those would be, if your outlet velocity is high, you can try. Can you do something with my heart slope? And it was a tentative, almost whispered answer. But I'll take credit for someone saying it. So slope, so the most powerful thing you could ever do is decrease the slope of your culvert. Um, that will have a dramatic impact on the outlet velocity. But that said, um, we don't always do that a lot because you can introduce some issues of then you have to make a transition from the stream bed into the culvert barrel because what you've really done is you've rotated the inlet of the culvert below the stream bed. This is the this is the outlet, and you're rotating the inlet below the stream bed to get a more shallow slope to drop velocity. And then you have to worry about well, how do you get the water in there? Are you going to create some channel instabil instabilities and head cuts and things like that? So it can be an issue. What else could you try? Here's the roughness of the base of the culvert. Yeah, that's exactly it. So um, it's maybe a material selection issue. So if you're using a concrete culvert or a smooth high density polyethylene culvert, uh, maybe you try a corrugated profile. Um, and I, I know some states are getting away from using um, corrugated metal pipe because they have you know corrosion and abrasion issues. But if you went from a smooth profile to a corrugated profile, increase the roughness, um, that can have a significant effect on your velocities, your flow velocities. So. Outlet control culvert barrel slope is important uh, for both your headwater and your outlet velocity calculations. All right, so here we are talking about effective roughness on a culvert. And so this is exactly the situation we were talking about, but this is more from a headwater angle and, and not a velocity angle. Um, if I have uh, initially a, what type of pipe do you think I'm using here if the roughness is 0.012? You said you use about 0.013. It's probably concrete or smooth plastic. Smooth plastic would probably even be a little bit, it might be like 0.01. Um, so if you have uh, a concrete pipe with 0.012 um, under a headwater of whatever this is, uh, then you're passing um, about 109 CFS. That said, then if you go to a corrugated metal pipe, and again, a 0.024 is pretty common for corrugated metal, uh, then you're dropping uh, your capacity from uh, 90 or 109 to 94 CFS. But the flip side of that is you're dropping um, the flow through here, but you're also decreasing velocities. And so we also know that what type of control is this? Outlet control, and we know that for two reasons. First, because it's full pipe flow, so that's an outlet control condition. Mild slope, full pipe flow, you're dealing with a lot of frictional resistance. The other reason we know that is, no yeah, so there's, um, oh, actually, so there's three reasons we know that. Uh, another one is there's no critical depth represented anywhere here, right? 
no critical depth, it has to be in outlet control. Um, because the tail water is not the, uh, the control system. Um, the other reason we know that is we have this effect. And we said that for capacity reasons, uh, for capacity calculations, the barrel roughness has no impact in inlet control. It just doesn't matter because the water just sees that orifice. And that's the scary part. And once it gets past that opening, then it's smooth sailing. It doesn't care what's going on in the barrel because it's just zipping through there. So the, the frictional resistance does not matter in inlet control. And we're here we see there's an impact, so this has to be out of control condition. So we said frictional resistance is a combination of roughness and length. Okay, so up here you have your um, initial roadway that was built maybe back in the 50s. Okay. And you used a four foot diameter culvert uh, with a length of 50 feet. And you see that your Q is now 94 cubic feet per second with Well, here in 2019, maybe you're doing roadway widening or you're adding some lanes. And you know, you've talked with, you've gone out in the field and talked with uh, the maintenance folks and you know, the landowners around there. And he says, yeah, we've never had any problem with roadway overtopping or flooding or whatnot. And you say, you know what? That four foot pipe, it's doing a good job. And so when we extend this, we're just gonna continue on with that four foot and we're good to go. Right? Or wrong. Well, if you don't analyze it, maybe you run into an issue because now uh, you have a length of maybe 200 feet of pipe. And if it's out like control condition, what have you done? You've introduced a lot more frictional resistance. So what does that water do? It comes and looks at that and says, you know what? I'm not sure I'm up for this. <laughs> Deep breath. Get bulked up, build up more head water, more energy, and squeeze through that 250, 200 feet of you know frictional resistance. So, um, in this case, it's showing, and, and I'm maybe we change this, but in this case, it's showing you if you're dropping your, your capacity. In rea reality, what's going to happen is uh, for the same flow rate, it's going to have to build up more and more head water to push that same flow rate through there. So. Guess what? And you, this is kind of cool because we can show this in the uh, boom. 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 Is it going to go over the roadway or is it not? You need to know and you need to do the hydraulic analysis. All right. So this is another reason why you have to look at is it inlet control? Is it outlet control? If I do a modification on the pipe, if I lengthen the pipe, if I try another pipe material, what's going to happen with my headwater? What's going to happen with my outlet velocities? Don't guess. Got to do some calculations. That's why we're spending time talking about all this and why we're going to do a pneumograph solution and look at HYA. All right. Effective tailwater, um, inlet control, effective tailwater on headwater. So here's my headwater up here. I can move this up and down. Here's the control section. I can move this up and down, tail water and outlet control. And tail water and inlet control is not going to affect the, the head water until maybe I push this tail water up and up and up. And what this does is it causes more of a reaction force and pushes water back up this way. And here's that hydraulic jump. And if you can picture this, as you increase this tail water, it's going to push back on this and back on this. And at some point, it could possibly flood out this hydraulic jump. It'll flood out critical depth and turn this into a outlet control. And then every time you increase the tail water, you're going to see that, see that reflected in the head water. But that doesn't happen very often. It could potentially happen, but not very often. So in most cases, we say in inlet control, changing the tail water's just not going to do anything to you. It's like on that uh, water slide, um, down in that plunge pool at the bottom, you know, they maybe put more water in the plunge pool because uh, of safety concerns or whatever. Standing up here at the top of the water slide, I just don't see I don't even know what's happening. Outlet control with low tail water, 
the control is actually critical depth, right? So if I have this low tail water and if I raise it a little bit, as long as I maintain critical depth here, there's no impact whatsoever on the headwater. Doesn't matter. Now, when I raise it high enough where I flood off critical depth, and as I raise the tailwater, I also raise the headwater. So it's just a matter of, is the tailwater the initial control or is critical depth? And if it's critical depth, as long as I maintain critical depth here, this is supercritical flow, whatever I do with that supercritical flow doesn't matter until I flood out critical depth, and this is now subcritical flow, and then as I increase this, I increase my headwater. I think that's shown in, in the culvert video on YouTube. All right, so this brings us to the process. I know you're saying finance this, right? So here we go. You go out in the field, and uh, maybe you're doing a paving project and you're checking, you're doing due diligence, so you're walking your project and you see a series or a row of culverts here. Um, maybe they're dish related culverts, maybe a couple of them are stream crossing culverts. You start taking a look at them and you see one that's kind of a little shaky looking, it has that abrasion, um, I think that uh, uh, Dorothy had, had implied. And so you say, you know what, I think we can do better, we might need to replace this. Um, so let's figure out, uh, let's do a hydraulic analysis and figure out what the replacement culvert will look like. So first, you're going to select a culvert. And you say, well, the maintenance folks say this existing one has been fine. We haven't really had any you know, maintenance issues here. No roadway over topping. Maybe I'll start with that as my initial guess at a replacement culvert. So you select one. And you use some educated guesses from your site visit, from talking with folks, right? So you, you take a guess at one. And then you're running through the analysis. There are two parts to analysis. You check it under inlet control condition. You check it under outlet control condition. Because you don't design a culvert, 99 times out of 100, you don't design a culvert to be inlet control or outlet control. I you know, get that question all the time. How do I design a culvert to be outlet control? Because I want to make sure I use as much of the barrel as possible. You don't do that. It's more dictated by what? Your, your site conditions and your slopes. So depending on what that is, that will probably play a large part into determining if that is an outlet control culvert or an inlet control. That's not something that you put into your design necessarily. But you need to consider both because you don't know how it's flowing. You're not going to guess. You're going to check it for inlet control and you're going to check it for outlet control and see which one gives you the highest headwater elevation. Okay, So you're going to check it under both these conditions. You're going to calculate that uh, upstream headwater elevation. And you're going to take the larger of those two. Here's the crazy thing about culverts. They sometimes go back and forth between inlet and outlet control. Sometimes they have plug flow. They make it plug with debris. They can switch things around. Some crazy things happen out there in the, in, on your projects. And one time it may be inlet control, and one time it may be outlet control, you're not necessarily always sure. So we're going to use the worst case for our design. And the worst case one is the one that gives us the highest headwater at the inlet. So we're going to check both, compare the headwaters, and take the worst case scenario. That's what we call the minimum performance criteria. Okay? And that's going to be our controlling headwater. Now we have to compare that to something to make sure that's okay. And we compare that to what's called the allowable headwater. The allowable headwater is not necessarily something that you calculate. It's actually something that you set as a do not exceed threshold for your design event. And that's based on your site visits and some of the background homework that you do for your project. If here's a sag point in my roadway, and I don't want roadway overtopping, right, for my design event, then maybe your allowable is set below that with some freeboard built in. So maybe my allowable headwater is here. If you have some private property that could potentially be impacted and you don't want to flood them out, and if you're, in a, if you're working in a detailed flood insurance study area, you realize that 
you have to be very careful about raising the water surface for your design flows. Uh, if you don't want to flood this person out, maybe your allowable headwaters below the level of their basement. Or it's maybe set by some commercial properties. Um, or um, other situations. What are some other situations that will help you set allowable headwater? Can you think of any? It's basically to, to mitigate any damage that can result from your design flood occurring. So it's not, again, it's not necessarily something you calculate, but it's something that you set as a threshold because if your design flood exceeds that threshold and the damage that's caused is not something that you can look at. Utilities? Utilities. Perfect. Perfect. Um, there's another criterion, and this is a little bit, you know, this goes back in the day when they were setting, you know, allowable um, headwaters. Headwater to the rise of your barrel. If this is a pipe culvert, it's headwater to diameter. If this is a box culvert, it's headwater to the vertical rise of the opening. And I think limits um, in the day were set around this ratio of maybe 1.5, 1 1.2, and you know, it varies. Uh, why do you think this could be an, a criterion for allowable headwater? Headwater to rise ratio, of, say 1.5. Why would that be important? Um, it's not necessarily a capacity thing. Think about back in the swimming pool. You dive down into the water to get that shiny silver dollar that someone threw in there. And your favorite uncle says, hey, I think coax you into you know, being a better swimmer to get that silver dollar in there. And the further down you go, the more pressure. Think of a headwater to diameter ratio of two or three or five. You're building up more and more and more of that hydrostatic pressure. And guess what? Our roadway embankments aren't designed to be dams, right? Most of the time. And we, we, we always say in Federal Highway, don't design your roadway embankments to be dams. You don't consider them to be dams. As that hydrostatic pressure, those, those, those the water forces increase with increasing head, um, that can destabilize your embankment. That the buoyant forces, if you're not careful, can flow at the entrance of your culvert. They can do all kinds of crazy things. Could be a safety issue. Or vehicle departures off the roadway. So there are some good reasons why this was limited and why we still limit this. So this could also set your allowable headwater elevation. So once you have your allowable headwater elevation, you've calculated your controlling headwater based on minimum performance. So you take the headwater that's the greatest between inlet and outlet control. You compare these two and see if your controlling headwater is less than your allowable. And if it is, you feel pretty good about that. So you've passed one design criteria. The next thing you've got to check is my outlet velocity, okay? If you're designing a culvert and you're, con you're, you're contracting uh, the flow area, we know from continuity, Q equals AV, as the flow area goes down, the velocity goes up, and sometimes you can have some crazy scour issues if you're, if you're making that flow area too small. And this is what we see with undersized culverts all the time. These outlet velocities are way too high. They didn't design them appropriately. They didn't use energy dissipation techniques. And you get these ginormous scour holes, all right? That water comes flying out of there. And again, water's like me. It wants to be chill, maybe a little bit lazy. It wants to calm down. And it's going to want to reduce its energy. And it does that by picking up soil, your stream channel, your stream banks, and it just picks them up and eats them and moves them and drops them and then it's back at its natural velocity. All right, so we need to make sure that our outlet velocity is okay. You should have uh, criteria for that in your EPG. Am I saying that still correctly? Is it EPG? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you satisfy your headwater is okay, you're not doing any flooding or overtopping your road, etc., etc. If your outlet velocity is okay, then you also need to make sure we talked about this with cover situations and other things, will my culvert system actually fit in my site? Or will I hit utilities? Or do or do I have a limited cover situation where my culvert's actually going to stick up above 
my road service, which isn't going to work. You know, those other types of things will actually fit within the site. And that's okay. And if you don't have any special requirements um, for uh, aquatic organism passage, you have those here. Special requirements for fish passage, aquatic organism passage. Because if you have to meet those, then that also has to go into the design process. And that's that's kind of like a, another lesson in our call of design course. But um, if you, let's just assume for this sake, you're doing like a ditch relief culvert, so you don't have that. And if this is all okay, then you're probably good to go. You also have to do your material selection, so you probably have material selection policies uh, here. So another thing that you'd have to do is, um, if you have really corrosive soil and water, then if you choose a metal pipe, then you probably also have to select some special coatings, and maybe you have to select a thicker gauge of metal so it lasts longer and doesn't corrode so quickly. Um, maybe you use concrete, or maybe you use high density polyethylene or some other materials. So there's also a material selection component to that as well. So that's the general idea. And you may have questions, and then my response to that would be, we're gonna practice. So we'll actually do this to make sure that it makes sense. So again, just some review. Um, the inlet control analysis to calculate the inlet control of headwater. Again, we use weir flow um, when our culvert is not submerged. It eventually transitions into orifice flow when our culvert becomes submerged. And so we use charts that build in the weir and orifice equations. Um, and those were determined from laboratory experiments back in the day by the Bureau of Public Roads and other entities. How that control analysis? Um, we actually do the energy analysis. So we're balancing energy from the upstream and downstream sides. The cool thing about the outlet control um, analysis is that uh, for the conventional culvert design where you actually have some ponded headwater upstream, we assume the velocity head is zero. zero because it's probably pretty close to zero, right? The pond and water upstream of the culvert is really subcritical. It's not moving very quickly. It has a low velocity, a very low velocity component. So V squared over 2G is going to be pretty low. So we'll say that at the upstream side, the total energy is your elevation head plus your pressure head, which is the water surface. On the downstream side, if we have this, if we assume the same pool conditions like high tailwater, then we'll say that on the downstream side, um, the velocity head is pretty close to zero. And, and again, this isn't the case in a lot of situations. But if we were to assume that, then we would start off with um, the elevation head, uh, which would bring us to the bottom of the channel. Uh, maybe the water surface, which would be our pressure head. We add in the energy losses, which are the entrance loss. In most cases, the entrance loss, the friction loss, and the exit loss. So those are all the energy losses. We add all that stuff up. We bring it back up to the top of the culvert, and that becomes our headwater elevation at the entrance. So we'll start simple and assume those things. <clears throat> so here's the case here. Um, elevation head gets you here. This gets a little bit tricky, so let's pretend we're looking at the tailwater for a second. The pressure head gets you here, so this is your hydraulic grade line. If you add in all of the head losses, entrance, barrel friction loss, exit loss, add all those in, you come back out, and this total energy plus the head losses equals this total energy, which is your head water up here, neglecting B squared over 2G. We have to go back here and look at this tailwater for just a quick second. Back in the day before they had computers, um, like we mentioned earlier, they developed charts and figures to do all these calculations. They didn't do them, they didn't do all these tedious calculations by hand every single time. When they developed the charts for outlet control condition, 
they assumed full barrel float all the way through. And therefore, friction, full barrel friction loss all the way through the barrel. If we have low tail water, we know that we don't have full barrel flow all the way through. But it's going to cascade down through critical, critical depth. So they had to make an adjustment so they could still use their charts that were developed for full barrel flow all the way through and make that compensation. So they didn't count this part of the friction loss. So what they had to do was they had they determined this through a little bit of experimentation. They said if my tailwater is really low, to actually use those charts that that were developed for frictional resistance of the entire barrel flowing pole, I have to make a little bit of an adjustment. So if my tailwater is low, I also need to calculate critical depth plus the rise of my culvert and divide it by two, and I'm going to calculate that value. And again, this is determined through experiment. I'm going to compare this value to the tailwater, and I'm going to use the one that gives me the largest answer. And that's going to become my H sub O value, or kind of like the pseudo starting point uh, of your hydraulic grade line that you then add the friction loss, or the, all the energy losses onto, that you then translate up here to get your headwater. All right. So again, this is an adjustment for very low tailwater situations where I violated my full barrel flow and my full barrel friction loss all the way through. So we make this adjustment. So what we're going to do in our in our hand calculations, we're actually going to compare um, tail, the low tail water with d sub c plus d over two, and we're going to use the larger of that two, the larger of those two values as our hydraulic grade line value here. Add on energy losses, and then come up here through balancing the energy equation and say this is our total energy up here, neglecting v squared over two g. What, what was the cap, <coughs> capital D in that equation? What did that stand for again? I, I say it's it's the pipe. I say it's the culvert rise because we're not always dealing with pipe culverts. If you're using exclusively pipe culverts, it's the pipe diameter. Okay. But since we use box culverts and arch pipes and other types of shapes, it's really the rise, which is the distance from the invert to the ground. It's one of those things, again, what is this? It's a minutia. It's one of those little details. You can spend a lot of time wrapping yourself around the axle on it. Um, it's an adjustment if we don't have full barrel flow so that we can use the nomographs that were developed for full barrel flow. Um, it's not, it's important to remember to do it, but it's not one of those cool big picture things that we need to keep up. Is a SGO, uh, no more depth or Oh, I'm sorry. So this is slope. Anytime you see us, it's slope. No, no, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this? Yeah. Is that normal depth? Is it normal depth? It's not. It's not always. If, actually, this is a good question. So the question is, is, is H sub O normal depth? If tailwater is the greatest of these two, and if you calculated tailwater using steady uniform flow conditions using Manny's equation, then H sub O is normal. Um, if you use tailwater, but you don't have steady uniform flow conditions, and you calculated tailwater in another way, then H sub O is not normal depth. Or if you calculated tailwater using uh, Manning's equation, but it's less than d sub c plus d over 2, so you use this value, then it's not normal depth. Does that make sense? But again, that's another, my, my, it's a great question. It's more of the, the in the weeds kind of thing. So, all right. So how do we calculate um, energy losses? Um, 
inlet energy loss. So how do we calculate our inlet energy loss for what type of flow control? Where are we calculating, calculating energy losses? Where are we calculating energy losses? It's outlet control. We're not calculating energy losses for inlet control. We're using the wear and orifice equations. So how do we calculate? So when you see inlet energy loss, don't equate that with inlet control. Okay? Inlet energy loss for our outlet control condition, um, this is the same thing with pipe flow. If you're doing water distribution and other types of things, um, the energy losses are typically some sort of a coefficient times your full barrel velocity head. Okay, and that's what we're going to use is the, is the velocity head in the barrel. And that, that coefficient comes from tables. Um, you're going to look these up in your EPG. And we also have them in HDS5, which is the manual on culvert design. And they're in Appendix C. Um, for thin edge projecting, the case of these is 0.9. For minor to fill slope, 0.7. End section, yeah, that one's a weird one. End section conforming to fill slope. Square edge at 90 degrees is 0.5. Socket end or a bevel uh, entrance is 0.2. You put that bevel on your head wall, that's a 0.2. So which is more efficient? Then edge projecting or a uh, maybe that bell end on your concrete pipe? Which one's more efficient? This one? Socket end. The socket end, why? The case would be is 0.2. If I take 0.2 times my velocity head, I end up with a head loss that's less than almost a full velocity head. So this one has less energy loss than this one. This one is more hydraulically efficient than this one. So as the case of E value goes down, your hydraulic efficiency goes up because your energy losses at the entrance are less. So you said we, so uh, d square root 2g is negligible. Is that only at the inlet side? Of the so inlet? that's when, we're, yeah, so that's when we're looking at the total energy level before it comes into the culvert. Mm -hmm. But we still need to calculate that all of the sum of those head losses, then the head loss coming in through the entrance as that flow actually contracts it picks up velocity head as it goes into the entrance. So there is, there is a measurable velocity head as it goes into the entrance. And we're going to assume the full barrel velocity head and therefore um, use uh, that to calculate that energy loss of the entrance. Yeah, but up there, up here in the pool level, um, the, the, the average velocity coming in is pretty low. Culvert barrel friction loss actually is a rearrangement of Manning's equation. Um, there's friction loss as it goes through the barrel. Uh, so we're going to actually be able to calculate that. And that's, you could calculate that through looking at Manning's equation. Um, however, uh, the nomographs have that built in. So it's not something additional that you need to calculate. Um, HYA does it automatically as well. So it's not something that we do by hand. Culvert exit loss, uh, we in the past have typically assumed that we're losing one full velocity head as the water comes back out into the barrel or into the tailwater. So it would be one times V squared over 2G, and that V squared over 2G uh, uses the velocity, that full barrel flow velocity. That's historically what we've done. And if you have, and I don't have a good picture here, if your tailwater is high um, and it's above the outlet of your culvert, it's a good assumption. As that water pushes into that high tail water, it's going to lose one full barrel velocity depth. If you have low tail water, then that assumption is overly conservative. And what you can do is you can take the velocity head in the barrel minus the velocity head in the tail water because your tail water will have some velocity at that point. You subtract those two, and the coefficient you'll use most likely is one. And that will give you something that's a little bit less conservative, but more realistic. Tailwater depth um, for your ditches, you're using Manning's equation. Um, the question came up, I think, and we'll partially address it here. Uh, this is probably where I need to show off my horrible artistic skills. Um, looking at pipes in series. Uh, 
I do it over here, can you see this okay? Don't we also have yeah. that thing? Right. Eric, there's also this digital projector you could do it on. Oh, yeah. Um, we're going to set that up for our work problem, but maybe for this, if I just sketch it real quick on this, it'll be fine. So, again, this is going to be horrible, but I don't think it's You have your channel scope here, okay? And then you have over here and then you have <laughs> it is what it is I actually you know I, I like smelling markers and I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> so you have another call over here and again this is, I, I feel bad this is just absolutely Cars it looks like two cars. <laughs> That's exactly what it looks like. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I was just thinking that this looks like two cars when, right before you said that. Um, do I have steady uniform flow conditions? No, because um, during my flood event, what's going to happen is if this were normal depth here, what I actually have happen is that the water backs up here and I have this headwater and then it comes back down like this, right? Mm -hmm. So if I use normal depth, I hope this is okay. If I use normal depth as my tailwater here, I'm going to be underestimating the actual tailwater depth potentially significantly if these culvert crossings are fairly close together. Something that you could do that would be on the conservative side is you could actually go to the downstream culvert, run the hydraulic analysis on this, calculate this headwater, and then use that headwater as the tailwater for this one. That would be a little bit conservative, or maybe a lot conservative, but it would be better than using normal depth, which would be way under conservative and could cause you some, some design issues. The other thing you could do is say, well, I'm not, I don't want to use normal depth and I don't want to use this headwater. I'm going to try to maybe you sketch out this profile and maybe you sketch in what you think the water surface looks like and it comes down a bit and maybe you just use that value for your headwater, or your tailwater for this one. It's going to be less than the headwater for the culvert, but it's going to be greater than the normal depth you would have calculated using Manning's equation. So you've got to make some engineering judgment there, and again, you put this in your documentation. Does that make sense? What if between, that, between those two culverts there was a cross pipe also adding into the flow? What would you... Yeah. Same same exact process. Do you think? I would, you know, I would go, I, I would start at my culvert outlet, and I would look downstream and think, is there anything that causes me to question the validity of normal depth? And if it is, I would go directly to that point and figure out how that's influencing things, and if I could do a hydraulic calculation on it to determine the depth, and then back that up into my tailwater. It's whatever's the, the first thing downstream that I encounter. It could get more complicated than that, but again, for most of your projects as roadway designers, you probably don't need to do a lot of extra sort of thing like that. It might be a ditch check or a little check dam in your ditch line. Maybe that bumps up your, your uh, normal depth uh, and plus a little bit extra. Um, so just use your engineering judgment, put it in your documentation. Your ditches, your ditch, your, your your ditch relief culverts are usually lower risk than your stream and river crossings. So the level of effort should reflect the level of risk. If you have, if you're working on a bridge project and you're worried about this, then you're not even using the HY8, you're using HECRAS or a 2D model, and it will take that into consideration, right? It does a standard step, you know, energy balance going from the downstream to the upstream. One more for the road. Okay. So that's what this says here. Uh, when you're working in streams and rivers, you're typically not using the HY8 as much because HY8, um, it, it doesn't look at a series of cross sections along your channel. It's really just what's happening at the crossings with one tailwater section. And we'll see that when we pull HYA out.
All right, minimum performance design concept. So we check uh, inlet control and outlet control headwaters. We take the larger of the two, we compare that to our allowable. If it's less than allowable, then the headwater's okay, and then we check outlet velocity. Outlet velocity, Q equals VA. If we need to figure out the outlet velocity of a culvert, the big picture concept, which is always simple, I'm maintaining this, I'm not going to back away from this. Big picture ideas are usually pretty straightforward. Um, I know my flow. I know my design cube. If I know my flow area, I can calculate the outlet velocity. The devil's always in the details. I need to calculate the flow area. Once you calculate the flow area, it's easy sailing from there. In inlet control, Again, remember the picture here, as the water dives down to critical depth, it eventually goes to supercritical. Um, it's not going to be uniform flow in this piece because it's kind of doing this, and that's not uniform. But for Lenny's longer culverts, it eventually reaches um, its normal depth again. So here's a key. Normal depth does not equate to subcritical flow. Subcritical flow has a normal depth also reach normal depth and supercritical flow. Okay? It's just the flow that normally occurs under that condition. So as this kind of strives back towards normal depth, then the flow area that I use to calculate my, act, my outlet velocity is the flow area associated with normal depth in inlet control. So once this reaches steady uniform flow conditions, I use Manning's equation, I can calculate the normal depth. We actually did that, we looked at that iterative process. If you did it by hand, it's kind of a pain, but you could technically do it. For box culverts, it would be easy. For circular shapes, it gets kind of crazy. Okay. But you can calculate normal depth, and then you can calculate the flow area. Q equals AV. I know my Q, I know my flow area, I get my outlet velocity. So in inlet control conditions, um, I can use uh, steady, uniform flow approximation to calculate my outlet velocity. In outlet control, um, again, I'm looking for what is my flow area. And then once I have my flow area, I take Q over A and I get B. So my flow area, if my tailwater is up here, what is my flow area coming out of my culvert? It's just the flow area, it's just the area of the culvert. My tailwater is up here. My flow area is the area of this culvert. As the water comes out, I use that area. And if it's if it's a circle, the area of the circle is what? Pi r squared. Mm -hmm. Pi r squared or pi squared over four. Or pi, what is it? Pi squared over four. Pi squared over four or pi. People like to use R. I usually use D, so pi r pi r squared. So you can calculate the flow area very easily if you have a pipe culvert with high tailwater, straight forward. If I have very low tailwater, and this plunges through critical depth at the outlet, the depth of flow I'm going to use to calculate the flow area is critical depth. If I can calculate critical depth for that shape, then I use that to calculate the flow area. And Q divided by A equals V. I get my outlet velocity. If my tailwater is above critical depth, but below the crown of my pipe, I can't use the full barrel area. I can't use critical depth. I use the area associated with my tailwater. And you've already calculated your tailwater depth, right? Using probably Manning's equation. So you have your tailwater depth. You actually just use that to calculate the flow area. Q divided by A equals velocity. So my I have low tail water. I calculate flow area using what depth? Critical depth. My I have high tail water. I calculate flow area based on what depth? D, the rise of my pipe, or my culvert. If I have 
tail water that's less, that's under the crown of the pipe, but above critical depth, and just use the tail water depth. Calculate the flow rate. If you have a rectangle, straightforward. But if you're not used to box culvert, do it by hand, you go insane. Even for circles. Okay? That's why we have charts to figure those things out for us. And in HYE, you don't worry about it at all. It just calculates it for you. Once you have your velocity, then how do you know it's OK? What criteria do you check it against? If you have an outlet velocity of 10 feet per second, is that all right? Yeah, um, and I don't know what's in your EPG as far as outlet velocities. Um, Chase, do you happen to know? Uh, it's like they try to keep it between 3 and 20 feet per second, so. Did you say between 3 and 20? 3 and 20 feet per second, yeah. That's a huge range. Yeah, well, they, they keep it between 3 or it has to be um, at least 3 because anything less than 3, it, you know, deposition might happen and then anything more than 20 would be erosion, so, yeah. Well, you can get, depending, it depends on your channel material, but if you have a sandy channel, um, you can get erosion at, you know, seven, eight feet per second probably. I think that's considered through pipes, though, so I don't know what it would be through channels. Yeah. So you would want to look at what the permiss, and we talked, we talked about this kind of like with channel design set more from a shear stress perspective, but for outlet velocities, you would kind of see uh, what the criterion are in a channel for permissible velocities. The general idea is you want to try to match the natural channel velocities to the degree you can. It's going to be hard if you're putting in a small culvert. As you know, you've already violated that. Um, but you want to do your best to try to match, in an ideal situation, match the natural channel velocities, which means putting in a larger culvert most likely, which means probably more expensive. Yeah. So you do a balance, and you just, the general idea is you need to check it against something. Okay. And if you suspect that you're going to have outlet scour because the velocity is high, can you change the material selection? Do you need an energy dissipator? Do you need maybe just something as simple as a neighbor at the outlet, which is usually pretty standard for, for culverts and even in ditch lines? So. You just need to do a comparison against something. The slide before this, the blank, the bottom, is that manic? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Anytime you see normal depth, you know that's right. calculated using maintenance equation. Yep, steady uniform flow. How's that velocity? So here's the thing, and so maybe I just misspoke. Here's a calculation that we've done. Um, this is an inlet control. So think your water slide example again. Uh, we have this large culvert, and maybe say this is, maybe say that's a four foot diameter pipe, okay, concrete pipe. Um, we see that uh, we have this outlet velocity at 14 feet per second, which is actually really high. And probably in most cases, unless you're discharging on the bedrock, it's going to be erosive to a degree. So we're not quite liking that. Um, actually, I did it backwards. We have this two foot one. <laughs> Sorry, delete that out of the video. So we have this two foot one, and we see that the outlet velocity is um, 15 feet per second. This velocity sub n, which means what? We calculated this. This is the normal velocity. We calculated this using the equation. So we say, well, this two-foot pipe is not going to cut it. If we just put in a four-foot pipe, our velocity should be fine. Well, we put in the four-foot one, and we see that the outlet velocity went from 15 feet per second to 14 feet per second. Why is that? Well, we've just redistributed the flow area a little bit, right? We've redistributed it from this to that, but we still have pretty much the same flow area at the outlet. And therefore, if our flow area is about the same, our velocity is going to be about the same. What we could have done with that two-foot pipe 
and say maybe instead of concrete, maybe we use a corrugated metal or corrugated plastic. And even if we have the same size, we see that um, going from 15 feet per second, we change the material type, cover and everything else remains the same or backfill, and we've dropped it from 15 to 11, which is pretty good. It may still be too high, but that had certainly more of an impact than making our pipe bigger. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, for the situation where you could actually make some hay on increasing the size of your polymer to reduce outlet velocity uh, would be a situation where you have at least, uh, well, definitely high tail water, right? Because you figure if you go from this size to this size, you are increasing your flow area and you're dropping your velocity. If you have in outlet control, if you have very low tail water, increasing the size isn't going to do anything for you. But if you have high tail water, then yeah, you have a lot more flow there, you know. So you are decreasing outlet velocity there. That doesn't happen a lot. Could could happen, but not a lot. I would think probably, um, unless you're on really mild slopes, that your tail water is going to be fairly low in a lot of cases. All right. With that, I am chewing.